Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Jack Desange, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Medical Therapeutics here at Allegan, an AbbVie company. You've likely heard that AbbVie and Allegan have joined forces. We're very proud of the Allegan name and heritage, and we're now known as Allegan and AbbVie Company. We share a common goal of developing world-class products and solutions for patients, and it's been a seamless transition. AbbVie and Allegan share a common vision to act with integrity, to serve the community, to drive innovation, but also to embrace diversity and inclusion. Together, we are working to have a significant positive impact on eye care professionals and their patients. R&D will always remain one of our top priorities. Innovation is in our DNA. We're constantly looking for ways to transform ideas into new possibilities. We look for better pathways for disease treatment. Whether it's finding a new solution, a new formulation, or a new delivery method in glaucoma, or retinal diseases, or corneal and ocular surface disease, or refractive conditions. We continuously strive to reinvest in our future and offer an ever-growing portfolio of effective and affordable treatment options for a better tomorrow. I can't emphasize also enough the importance of our relationship with you and our collaboration with eye care professionals. We embrace our partnership with you and our shared goal of improving the quality of life of your patients. If you have any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and share it with us. But thank you for all that you do for the eye care profession and take care. Welcome your host and co-host for today's episode of the Ocular Service Academy podcast, Dr. Scott Schachter and Dr. Christopher Starr. Welcome everybody to the Ocular Service Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. I'm Scott Schachter joined by Chris Starr as always. Today we have Dr. Carlos Belmonte joining us all the way from Spain, apparently a lovely place in Spain that's a tourist town. I hope to actually get out to Spain. I've never been. I hope to be there someday. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Belmonte. Well, thank you for the invitation. And of course, you are also invited to come to Alicante, which is the name of the city Alicante, where I'm right. living now. And as I say, most welcome if you want to spend some days over here. It's on video, it's on audio, it's recorded, official invitation from Dr. We'll, Belmonte. We'll be there for sure. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Chris, I, I don't know about you, but Going through TFOS dues to pain and sensation is of great interest to me. To me, I look at the neurosensory component as a sort of forgotten aspect of the lacrimal function unit. And in my own practice, now that I'm tuned into it, now that we have treatments for neuropathic pain, treatments for neurotrophic keratitis, I think it's, it's really allowing me to better take care of my patients. What about you, Chris? I agree. I think it's uh, the nerves and the understanding of the corneal nerves and their role in pain and, and other uh, things like itch and various other quote unquote uh, classic symptoms. I think that's really the sort of the, the, the next big frontier in all of ocular surface disease and dry eyes. So um, it, it's so delightful to have, you know, one of the world experts with us to share his wisdom and knowledge and, and some of the uh, great uh, anecdotes from the actual TFOS dues to subcommittee, uh, but more importantly, relevant nuggets and, 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 and words of wisdom for the average practitioner, eye care provider, optometrist, and, and ophthalmologist out there. What a, a great treat to have Carlos Belmonte with us. Absolutely. Do Dr. Belmonte, what was the, what was the impetus or the, the idea behind pain and sensation? And how did you come to be the subcommittee chair? Okay, let me first comment about the, the perception of ophthalmologists on pain, because if I belong to a family, I am the fourth generation of ophthalmologists. My grandfather was an ophthalmologist, my father we are now, three of my brothers and sisters are ophthalmologists and my nephews and so on. So I have been surrounded by ophthalmologists. And pain has been always considered a, a collateral question in, in, in ophthalmology because the major diseases in, in eye problems, they cause without pain. We don't have pain in, in except in congestive glaucoma, glaucoma is silent, retinal problems are silent, most of them are silent. And I think that the change in the attitude of ophthalmologists came by the development of surgery, of, of um, particularly anterior segment surgery, <laughs> and particular 
uh, for to correct photorefractive problems. And in the side of, of the uh, of the optometrist is coming from the contact lenses. Is suddenly the, the the ocular pain, particularly the pain arising at the ocular surface, became an important problem. But um, in my case, I started to work on pain because uh, I, I am an MD, but I was dedicated to research most of the time. And when I, I was in the US, when I came back to Spain, <laughs> I had to start to work in a problem that I wanted, a problem that has some medical relevance because of my training. And pain was the subject. And because of this past ophthalmological tradition in the family, I look for the cornea as the simplest model where nerve endings for pain were extremely rich and without any other um, complicating factors like vessels and other type of structures making it complicated. It was only pain there. So this is why I started to work in, in pain. And I must confess that, that, that in those years, <laughs> I used to go to Arvo and we were three or four people interested in pain in the whole arm. Um, I always remember our posters there and some people came like Roger Boyerman and David Morris, some people like that came. <laughs> and we, we were talking five people among us because nobody had any interest <laughs> or idea on pain. And now on the contrary, as you know better than I do, <laughs> has become a forefront problem in, in ophthalmology and our work, which is very pleasant for us, is now attended. And, and the reason I, um, I was the, the head of the DFOS pain side is because I collaborated and attended. Uh, they were very sensitive in the ocular uh, surface um, society about the, the, my work because they were very interested in ocular surface pain. And they invited me to several of their meetings to the previous contact lens at uh, pain uh, work. I was I participate and then they invited me very kindly to chair that. Also, I'm afraid because I was the oldest of all of them <laughs> in terms of tradition in working in electrophysiology of the eye, because as I say, uh, we were very few at the beginning. I used to make the joke of, of saying, I'm, I, I am the best in the world in, in eye pain. And they say, Carlos, you are normally a person that is, is, is humble. Why you say that? I said, because I am the only one. I was the <laughs> audience is doing this. So it was easy to be the first. But the reality is that uh, now we... Uh, we did a very good work in that in that committee because they were excellent new generations and and were, was a very good selection of people from very different approaches to pain. Are you and this might be the hardest question of all? Are you able in say one or two minutes to explain the innervation of the ocular surface, the cornea, trigeminal? ganglia and all, and all the, the whole lacrimal functional unit of the eye in, can you explain it in almost lay terms for the, for me <laughs> and yeah. the, the general population that will be watching this in like, two minutes or less? Yeah, it's, I think it's simple to explain. They are nerve terminals which are sensitive to external forces. And depending on the type of force to which they are more sensitive, they have been classified as polymodal nociceptors that respond to everything, basically, mechanical, thermal, chemical forces. Uh, mechano nociceptors, which are only sensitive to mechanical forces, and thermal receptors that respond to temperature changes in the, in the non-noxious range in principle. So those nerve endings, they send signals to the cell body because they are originated in neurons in the, in the trigeminal ganglia. And the trigeminal ganglia send this information to centers in the brain, some of them that regulate the sensation of pain following the same pathways in the nervous system that pain uses for other pain from other areas of the face or the body. 
and that this, that same information also joins in lower levels of the of the brain in and the spinal cord, the upper spinal cord. From there, they send signals to the reflex signals to the tissues in the eye, like the or surrounding the eye, like the lacrimal glands. So, and in the case of, of lacrimation, um, the nerves participate in maintaining the background secretion of tears. When there is either changes in temperature, which means in evaporation of the eye, they are stimulated and then they produce more tears. When there is a noxious stimulus, a damaging stimulus on the ocular surface of any kind, these nerve fibers produce, again, reflexly an increase of tearing and some emotional parts of our brain also stimulate tearing by, by a separate pathway. And you know, in, in practice, in practice, well, we've we've lectured for years and we've all accepted as fact that signs and symptoms for dry disease often don't match, right? Right. We've always said signs and symptoms don't match. That's why we need to look for both. Does does the neurosensory component account for uh, most or all of that mismatch? Well, I think the the mismatch between the 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 amplitude of the sensory signals that produce the sensation of pain and the real damage is because nerve fibers for pain, they are activated by tissue damage and inflammation, but they can be also activated by their own damage by other things or by processes that they are not directly acting on the nerve endings, but on the cell bodies, in the trigeminal ganglion, or in upper levels of the nervous system. This is why we have what we call the physiological pain, which is the pain that follows the, the rules of nature, that pain is a protective mechanism, versus when that system works poorly or is damaged and produces by itself without any kind of peripheral signal activating the system produces pain anyway. And this is something that uh, we have been increasingly aware in these last 10, 15 years, because uh, we thought of, the, of this reflex and, and regulating system as something very rigid, like the cables of a TV. And it doesn't work that way. They are very plastic. So they can start to function abnormally when uh, many different things happen. And, and when there is diabetes or there is any, any other type of, of uh, an injury or a tumor or, or so many things or an inflammation by completely different reasons, nerves begin to work abnormally and they produce a sensation that are abnormal sensations in terms of of the protection of the eye as, as such. Well, I think that's one of the areas that does tend to be a bit confusing for uh, practitioners. It, you know, and even me just listening to what you were saying, I understand it all, but there were times when you were just discussing this uh, when I thought, oh, he's talking about neuropathic pain, you know, abnormal nerve uh, signals and the nerves sort of triggering and firing abnormally to create pain. And then I heard things like diabetes and surgery and other things that traditionally we think of as decreasing corneal sensation and leading to a neurotrophic situation. And so I'm wondering if you can explain for the listeners and for me and, and Scott, kind of what happens to the, the nerves to lead to both neuropathic and neurotrophic conditions and do some conditions like let's say LASIK or, or, or a surgery of any kind on the cornea, can it go in either direction and lead to both in some patients, neuropathic, and in some patients, neurotrophic. Yes, and, and both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the problem that, I mean, any, any pathology of the uh, sensory pain system can give negative or positive signs, mm -hmm. okay? And this is one point. So the lack of sensitivity, the diabetic patients, they have a lower corneal sensitivity, ocular surface sensitivity, and in particular in the cornea. We found that years ago. 
still, um, but they have the lack of the nerves or the reduction of the nerves or the damage of the nerves. At the same time, they produce very easily trophic damage of the cornea because the nerves are releasing trophic substances, neuropeptides and other trophic factors that keep the epithelium intact. And the epithelium is extremely delicate. So the, the density of the innervation goes down. This maintenance of the corneal epithelium uh, becomes compromised and anything can produce a damage in the cornea. So this subject may have a very low uh, corneal sensitivity and no pain. In general, diabetic pain in the eye is rare, is not common. And is very common in the, in, the, in the feet, for instance, you know. But on another hand, is, is a, it creates a lot of trophic disturbances in the, in the cornea. So I think we cannot be too simple in the definitions. And the other thing is that when the problem happens, the, the morphological and, and functional disturbance affects mainly the nerve endings, and they are not there. They cannot send signals to the nervous system, and so there is no sensory information, and there is a totally complete anesthesia. So there is no sensitivity. However, if those nerves, if those broken or damaged nerves, begin to have their own changes due to the, the, the injury, they begin to produce abnormal molecules that creates spontaneous activity in these broken nerves. So paradoxically, sensitivity is very low, but pain is very strong because this nerve, broken nerve is firing impulses all the time and is sensing, sending signals that really cheat the brain and produce sensations of pain. And that was some, I think the first that, that clinically understood that in, 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 the, in these years that I, I, I know were Perry Rosenthal in, in Boston. He was an ophthalmologist that was a pioneer in my opinion. Of, and he didn't know much about the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of nerves. But the first time we talked each other, I was delighted to speak with uh -huh. him because he was somebody that understood and, and was asking very intelligent questions for, for our neurophysiologist. Yeah, and anecdotally, I have a, a patient I'm treating now with neuropathic pain who has been uh, almost completely cured via the pro's contact lens uh, that, exactly. I think he, that yeah. he developed. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and do you have, have we learned anything with refractive surgery in the last several years to reduce the risk of causing neuropathic pain or neurotrophic keratitis? Well, I think, I think we, we learn a, a number of things, but the, the reality is that we all, including the patients, have to accept that it is, it is unavoidable to damage the nerves when you do refractive surgery. By definition, you are changing, acting on the structures that uh, maintain the nerves in, in the, the substrate of the nerves are the epithelium cells and the subepithelial uh, layers and the, the stromal, the upper stromal layers and so on. So to produce the change that we are seeking when we do photorefractive surgery requires to damage the nerves. The only point is that I think uh, the surgeons became were soon of that, and uh, they are now trying to minimize the damage. But we are now working personally, and my, my group and, and, and myself, we are now centered in, in the processes, in the, in the mechanistic processes that occur when the nerve endings are growing, regrowing spontaneously for regeneration under natural conditions because the epithelium is renewing in two, three days completely. So the nerve endings are all the time moving and are very active tissues. And what we are trying to understand is whether the, 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 this normal process of reconstruction, of continuous reconstructions 
of the nerve under normal conditions can be controlled after the, the damage that we produce with the surgery. And I think when we understand this process better at the level of the molecules and the, the, the mechanisms, it will be easier to, to prevent the, the changes that occur. Some of them are irreversible. And it changes tremendously from one person to the other. You know? Probably the, the, the surgeon, the, the ability of the surgeon to prevent this damage is, is part of the problem, but I don't think it's the important part. I think it's more a, an individual question. Even pars plane to vitrectomy can cause damage, correct? And you can end up with neurotrophic patients from vitrectomy, uh, correct? Absolutely. And from cataract extraction and from anything that damages the nerves. I mean, the problem is that they have been put aside because surgeons don't like to work about, to, to talk about problems that they don't understand why that happens because he did the same thing that he does all the time and suddenly this patient comes and complains and, and in a given moment I always tell them because I receive letters from desperate people that they have tremendous um, neuropathic pain with, with which is, is a life killing <laughs> situation it destroys the, the life of some people I think that with all this education that we've, you know, like you're saying, we've lear learned so much in the last since TFOS dues too, and, and before it, that uh, even though it's still virtually impossible, as far as I know anyway, to predict who might develop a neuropathic situation nor neurotrophic situation after surgery of any kind, but what we, what, but I think the tremendous benefit to what you're doing with your work and, and TFOS does too, and what we're doing here today, the um, awareness preoperatively. Uh, and so now that we know what neuropathic pain is and that we're, and other practitioners and surgeons are learning what it is, similarly with neurotrophic, that we're identifying it more prior to surgery and not doing surgery on those patients who have a baseline preoperative abnormality of their nerves, which, whichever direction it is. And things like the ASCRIS algorithm and, and other educational uh, initiatives and the TFOS dues 2 algorithm, diagnostic algorithm, all of that has led to this better understanding and just more awareness amongst all eye care providers that these things exist and we have a better idea of, of identifying them preoperatively. And now we are saving a lot of patients who might otherwise have had a surgery that might have made their nerve situation worse, and now we're just screening them out uh, as non-candidates, which I think is tremendous. But on the flip side of that, if the patient who doesn't have any preoperative problems and who is a good candidate and has laser vision correction or any other eye surgery and then develops a problem afterwards, well, at least now we also have better treatments, we can identify the problem afterwards and, and give it the proper diagnosis, whether it's neuropathic or neurotropic or something else or dry eyes even, and then we have targeted treatments now that can actually reverse it in a lot of cases. Not everybody, but in a lot of them we can. And I think yeah. that all of this work that you've done has really led to this amazing uh, situation and it will only get better as time goes on. Well, thank you. But it, it is true. Absolutely. I fully agree with, with your comments because I, I think to evaluate the patients, to know the, whether she or he has more possibilities of having problems is, is a, a preoccupation. Now we are developing, and, and is, this is still in the, in, in the oven, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not public, but we develop an instrument that will evaluate in a very rapid way what is the tearing capacity of an individual. Clinicians, they know very well now that people with dry eye are not good candidates for photorefractive surgery in principle. With, um, I have been trying to do in the, last, in the last few years is to transform that in an objective value so that we can measure the tearing capacity of the individual, both for photorefractive surgery, but also for, for contact lens fitting because contact lenses produces pain and discomfort and in the, the less, um, properly humidified is the eye, the easier the, this will occur. So we develop an instrument that is, we call it onion. <laughs> I 
the, <laughs> call it I onion because it will be a way of measuring the the total Turing capacity of individuals. So that will not cure, but will try to prevent and to evaluate more delicately when to act and when not to act at the risk and to to advance the people the, the possibilities, the risk possibilities. But the other thing I wanted to comment is that the ophthalmologist suddenly they they became very concerned that this is a good thing with with the neuropathic pain, but neuropathic pain has been always there, not in the eye, but also in any other surgical procedure. I remember a colleague, a Swedish colleague, that told me, she said that she started to analyze the pain of people that has had a thoracotomy to, for an open heart surgery. 40% of them, after that surgery, years after that surgery, they have a tremendous neuropathic pain in the, of the, of the, in the, in the scar. And, and of course, the surgeon said, but you know, I, I saved your life. Don't come me with this problem. It's better to feel pain than don't, not to feel anything. And they were putting aside the problem that these people were having a low quality life because of the neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is the, the most serious pain in, in medicine in many of uh, situations, but unfortunately it affects more women, it affects more old people, and there is a tendency to consider that, well, they protest of everything. They claim always that they have pain, but it's a real thing, you know, and we need to, to deal with this. Well, that patient recognition, you know, Chris, I, um, when you see refractive surgery patients or cataract surgery patients over the years, and they come back and they're saying, you know, I can see great, but my eyes feel terrible. You put in your vital dyes, you take a look, everything looks great. Five years yeah. ago, 10 years ago, what did you tell that patient versus what are you telling them now? Well, I think to begin with, you, the ophthalmologist, I think they are much more sensitive and understandable of, of, with the patient. So they don't try to... What the only problem is that in a given point, ophthalmologists or surgeons in general cannot do much. I mean, the, the pain units that are created are being created into the into the hospitals. They know better how to manage the drugs, which are still very unspecific. Is one of the problems because they are basically anti anti excitation i mean drugs that are like epilepto anti epileptogenic drugs general drugs for the nervous system that reduce the activity in the sensory system but also in many other neurons so their specificity is poor they have many side effects but at least they know, they are updated of what is coming on every day and I am very confident that with the advance in the in the in, in sodium channel blockers and particularly and potassium channel modulators that can regulate the degree of excitability to reduce the this abnormal excitability of the damaged cells can is the is the not so long term because they are people doing really wonderful work and this is a general work not only for the eye but for any other neuropathic pain and chris chris what about you what in your own practice i'm curious what, what you've seen yeah i mean i think you know in this day and age i think there was a tendency I, i'm not sure i was necessarily guilty of it but there was a, a tendency i think back in the old days where if a pa patient had complaints about pain and, and discomfort but their their surface looked great there was no staining like you said that there might have been a tendency for some practitioners to say, well, this patient is whining, there's nothing going on, they're crazy, whatever 
you know, psychiatric diagnosis you want to you want to lay out there. But it and it led to some friction, I think, between the doctors and patients and frustration and patients seeking other opinions and and you know that that vicious circle. Uh, and these days, now that we have this better understanding, uh, and certainly in my practice, I'm I'm thinking about neuropathic pain so much sooner especially when there's a um, scratch in my head, there's a disconnect between signs and symptoms that neurotrophic and neuropathic are front and center in my diagnostic day-to-day -day algorithm in my head. And, uh, and then pursuing, you know, the definitive tests and, and pursuing treatments designed for those things. And again, it's a testament to the work that Carlos has done and others uh, that we're all thinking about this much sooner now. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Those patients, yeah, I think uh, you it can lead to really unhappy patients unless you Very acknowledge much. acknowledge their pain is real and try to find them solutions, right? I think that hands uh, off a lot of problems. This, I think this is the point. I mean, we the tendency is to say, well, this person is, is disequilibrated, you know, is, is, she or he is, is so excited and so, so negative and so on. But, you know, if you have pain all day long, you cannot be very happy, even if you try. I mean, it's, it's a situation that is a, is a, a real challenge to, to not for normal life. So I think we need to be very, and the family around, I mean, there's some degree of psychological support that uh, these people need. And this is why I tend to send them when they cross, when the ophthalmologist has proven that nothing is happening at the periphery that justifies that. It is obvious that we are dealing with a neurotrophic, neuropathic pain. And if it doesn't have, that happens also, any neurotrophic problem, then the question is that the excitability of the pain neurons of the eye are abnormal. Or the, the central, uh, in the, the thalamic or the, the midbrain centers that receive that information are functioning abnormally. So we are dealing with a neurological problem. And this neurological problem has to be treated by the people that deals with these problems. I must confess that they are not obtaining big results, but I think they solve a percentage of those cases, and they alleviate at least the, the, the situation of those, of those people. You know, this, I have this question this is for both of you. This is how I manage it in my practice. And we always try to focus on clinical takeaways in these podcasts that we're doing. Tell me if this is a rational approach. If I've got a patient complaining a lot about pain, their eyes look pretty good. Maybe there's a little bit of ocular surface damage. I put in a drop of preparacaine. So if I tell you your pain level is eight out of 10 and we put in preparacaine and it goes to zero, then I'm optimistic that I can work on the front of the eye and provide you relief. If your pain stays at eight out of 10, now you're a pain management referral. That's how I approach it. Is that a reasonable approach? I think it's a brilliant approach, Scott. I, think I told that long ago. I say the first to, to my colleagues, and I am so happy that you find that by yourself because it's, this is the way of distinguishing peripheral from central pain. And peripheral pain is always much easier to deal with because it is, even if it is the result of damage nerve endings in the ocular surface, to block or to decrease the activity of these nerve endings can be obtained even with low levels of anesthetic. I remember years ago, we patented the use of very low concentrations of lidocaine, do whatever, what, exactly what you said, to reduce the pain of people that the pain had a peripheral origin. However, the Food and Drug Administration, I, I did that collaborating with people in alcohol, and they asked the Food and Drug Administration, and they say, by no means we will use low concentrations of lidocaine in the eye, because the experience with anesthetics in the cornea, you know, in the past, was that they produce ulcers and, and a number of, so that has been banned completely, it's absolutely prohibited. But um, now, in, in general pain, lidocaine is being used in low concentration because at low concentration is not an anesthetic. It is a reductor of the excitability of the nerve fibers. And mm -hmm. so that puts down the, the, this discharge, 
this firing continuously that is the basis of of neuropathic continuous pain. Do you I do think, the same, Chris? I saw you nodding your head. How totally, you yeah. Imagine? That's you know, I, I, I when I'm thinking neuropathic, that's the test that I, I typically do, and of course, I'll also probe maybe a little deeper into the systemic medical history. Is there neuropathic? Are there neuropathic issues elsewhere? Are there easily identify uh, identifiable risk factors that as an ophthalmologist or optometrist, we might have not even asked about various like diabetic neur neuropathy and things like that or other, you know, I've had so many patients where when I start asking those questions, it, it becomes very obvious that there is this systemic issue that I wouldn't have otherwise really known about that they're already being treated for you know, pain in their toes, you know, for uh, the, the neuropathic type pain. And so it makes, you know, perfect sense when we think about it and correlate it to these other things when, when there's an eye issue. But I agree with you. Um, when, I, when I make that, when the proparacaine doesn't fully take away the pain or tetracaine or whatever it is that we use, that does uh, spark a referral to a pain clinic for most likely a systemic medication to, to handle the central pain. Do you have a pain clinic you work with or a certain referral? Mechanism? At, at Weill Cornell, there, there is a pain clinic. So uh, I do send them to them. That's great. I, I saw a patient this last week who I walked in the exam room, her eyes are closed. She can barely open them and describes her body as feeling like it's wrapped in hot barbed wire. She's had a couple of ophthalmic surgeries. She's in um, a bad way. And so we're certainly working uh, with her pain management clinic as well. And that's a tough one. So today we'd like to welcome a special guest, Dr. Laura Perriman, a friend of ours, uh, an ophthalmologist in Seattle, Washington, who has a question for Dr. Belmonte. Hello, Dr. Belmonte. Thank you so much for joining everyone and helping us better understand corneal neuropathic pain. I'm Laura Perryman from Seattle, Washington, and I'm delighted that you're doing this for us. Thank you so much. There's a lot of interest in corneal neuropathic pain, and I come at it from a clinician's perspective, but also a molecular biologic perspective. I am really interested in what we've learned since the TFOS News 2 report, that awesome chapter on pain that you chaired and wrote is, is still the go-to for the basic information, but I know we've learned a lot since then. And I was wondering if you could fill us in on the innovations that have come about on the TRP family, super family of receptors. I'm interested in TRPA1 and V1 and also the TRPM8 receptor and its role with agonists and antagonists in modulating corneal neuropathic pain. I'm also wondering if you can fill us in on the new therapeutics that are coming to the fore that help us to orchestrate those receptors and decrease the nociceptive signaling in the nerves. I'm also hoping you can help us understand the role of everyday exposures and potential aberrant activation of these receptors, such as with everyday exposures to aromatic aldehydes, such as menthol and cinemates and thymol, things like this, and how that impacts positively and negatively patients' neuropathic pain and their nerve disease state. Thank you so much for all you do for helping the world understand this problem better. We really appreciate it. I think in these last five years, the progress in understanding how the injurious stimuli acting on the ocular surface, in particular on the cornea, activate these nerve pain nerve fibers that we were commenting, has been spectacular. Spectacular. It's, it's uh, one of the fields that grows a lot in, in science, recent neuroscience. Uh, basically, uh, what happens in the eye is that we have identified that they are many of those channels also in the corneal nerve fibers. 3B1 are very important, 3PA1, PSO2 for mechanosensory forces, uh, 3PA8 for thermal stimuli, so that they are different molecules to evoke pain in the central nervous system, but also to detect external stimuli. So if we are able to develop molecules to selectively block those channels, we can act in a much more specific way in reducing the activation of the full nerve fiber. And that will decrease selectively the signals 
that when they are conveyed to the to the central nervous system evoke pain. I think this is the big hope of the of our future, and in that sense, I am very very optimistic about the new drugs that I know that many of our colleagues pharmacologists are developing, trying to target specifically the different channels. And we are at the beginning of that field, but it's very promising. Excellent. Uh, very, that's great. That's a, that's a great explanation of a complicated topic. And we thank uh, Dr. Perriman for providing her question today. We have been talking most of the time about neuropathic pain, okay? And there is always, in any damaged ocular surface, there is some degree of neuropathic pain. But do not forget that most of the dry eye discomfort, the tremendous pain that is called neuropathic pain normally, is an extremely extended and very unpleasant situation. And that has to do with an inappropriate wetting of the ocular surface. And the nerves, they, grow, they play a very important role in maintaining and regulating this tear flow. So I have the impression that ophthalmologists now have a tendency to consider neuropathic everything. But when there is inflammation, local inflammation, there is activation, normal, natural activation of peripheral nerve fibers. And this is probably more extended and, and more common by far than damage that produces this abnormal peripheral or central even neuropathic pain. So to our colleagues, I would like to tell them, don't get in love with the last idea. And hyperosmolarity can trigger the, the same nociceptors to, to uh, exactly. increase Exactly. But not only the nociceptor, but also the call receptors, which are the ones that signal that the eye is getting dry. Right. Because to maintain the basal tearing, we use the cold thermal receptors, which are the same that we have in the skin or in the mouth that detect humidity and with humidity and osmolality. Because when there is evaporation, the temperature goes, da uh, goes down, but the concentration of, of sodium chloride in particular goes up, and that overstimulates those called thermoreceptors. Right. So this is a potentiation of both effects. And that produces, theoretically, should produce an increase in tearing, reflex increase in tearing, in basal tearing. But we know that some of those fibers also signal ocular dryness, unpleasant dryness, and pain. They are polymodal nociceptors with channels for cold. One thing I learned, which was interesting to me, learning more about neurotrophic keratitis, was the relationship between the epithelium and corneal nerves. And essentially, is it safe to say that the, the nerves feed the epithelium and the epithelium feeds the nerves with different factors, correct? Absolutely. And, and it's true that we know still very incompletely the, the, how this crosstalk happens. I think this is one of the most promising fields in the future of, of the anterior segment biology is, would be to understand what factors are the ones that determine either release by the nerves or by immune cells or by, because there is a, a, a crosstalk between the immune system and the, the nerves and the cells in the, in the cornea. I think it's a, it's a wonderful study subject for the future because they we know very very few things still on the on the picture i mean we don't have a complete picture of how this interaction occurs well dr belmonte it's been a real pleasure uh, i know that i could spend hours talking to you days talking to you about this there's it's such an unknown part again of the lacrimal function unit 
that may explain, you know, we've historically treated aqueous insufficiency and evaporative dry eye. And just now that we have these treatment options and recognition of the importance, the roles, the, the role of the nerve is uh, in, in lacrimal function unit, I find it just very, very fascinating. But like you said, don't jump right to that conclusion. It's important to optimize the surface of the eye. Long-standing yeah. inflammation, this nociceptive damage can lead to neuropathic pain or neurotrophic keratitis. So uh, we want to thank you so much and hope to someday get to Alicante, Spain. And uh, <laughs> when the pandemic stops, I'm getting my second vaccination today. So I'm, oh, uh, God, lucky. <laughs> I'm hoping that means I can get on a plane in the near future. We'll see. Uh, Chris, anything else from you? You know, like I agree with you. We, I could talk for another hour or two with Carlos. I had so many other things I wanted to talk about. Esthesiometers and measuring corneal sensation and various neurosense stimulation devices and treatment. I mean, there's so many things, but maybe we'll do another a part two at some point in the future. Yeah, and we are looking at doing a roundtable, and uh, you're certainly going to be invited, Dr. Belmonte. So hopefully down the road, we can get you to be, take part in that and look forward to hearing about your future research you've got cooking in the oven right now. Yes, we, we, will, we will tell you what is going on. Fortunately, it doesn't stop. Despite the, the, this pandemic, we are still working. So. Great news. Great news. Well, thank you again. And uh, uh, thank you to the listeners today. We will be talking pain and sensation again with Dr. Pedram Haran and not Glor down the, down the road. And we are looking at doing a round table. Uh, so be sure not to miss that. And uh, thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Thank, thank you, you very much, Scott and Chris, for your nice questions and your, your sympathy. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube.